Good morning. Welcome to Erlanger Baptist Church. We are so happy to have you this morning. Um, I want to point out a couple of things from your worship guide. Um, one thing is that we have a team in Poland. I don't know if you guys knew that or not, but uh, we're praying for our team in Poland. They have arrived. They're going to be coming back here in a few days. They are uh, teaching English and uh, having activities with a, uh, a camp there in Gdansk. And so we need to be in prayer for our team that they would uh, have health and that they would arrive back safely to us in the upcoming days. Um, we also have a, uh, an afternoon tea coming up on August 11th for all of our ladies. So if you guys are interested in that, uh, see the information in the bulletin. Uh, there is also a, um, a church conference coming up on the August 4th. So I need you guys to be aware of that. So there's a ton of information here in your worship guide. I also wanted to welcome you guys, uh, any visitors that are with us. There is an insert here in your bulletin. So if you guys want to rip that out and fill out that information, we also have a gift for you guys in the back between the double doors. So um, there's a lot of information in there. And I have a scripture to read for you guys to open us up. It's in Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died... I saw that the Lord seated on the right seated on the throne high and exalted and the train of his robe filled the temple above him were seraphs each with six wings with two wings they covered their faces with two they covered their feet and with two they were flying and they were calling to one another holy 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 is the Lord God almighty the whole earth is full of his glory at the sound of their voices the doorposts thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day that you've given us the opportunity to gather together. Lord, I thank you as we go into this time of worship uh, that we would get to worship you in spirit and in truth. I thank you that uh, you have gathered us here and that we can sit under your word. I pray that your word would affect us and that our hearts would be knit together with you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning. This morning I'm not preaching. I get to lead uh, in singing. And that passage that uh, Shane just read for us, that picture of Isaiah chapter 6, um, I hope that that invites us in um, to worship this morning. We have a God who has created beings that are magnificent and glorious around his throne, constantly proclaiming night and day, holy, holy, holy. We have a God that we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks, getting to hear about his attributes. And this morning, they're going to be, we're going to be sharing about God's holiness and I just want you to take a, a moment um, as we start and just to kind of reflect, what does it mean that God is holy to you? Like, how does that change the way that you step into this room? Right? We, maybe you've come from a life group. Maybe you've just gotten here and, praise the Lord, you've made it before we started um, walking into the room. And your mind and your heart are all over the place. But you have stepped into a, a moment now where we have been invited into the Holy of Holies because of what Jesus Christ has done, that we actually come into the presence of the one true living God to meet with him this morning. That's the invitation that we have. And I pray that as we accept that invitation, that we would experience him rightly. Would you stand as we worship?
saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. I mean, have you guys watched the Olympics, anything so far? All right, so the opening ceremonies, uh, I guess they drew a little bit of ire and attention um, with some kind of mocking of some things with, whether it's uh, Last Supper, uh, some other things. And I found something, I just find it interesting, right? Like, to me, the fact that they go and mock it is evidence of they can't knock it. Like, that's the fact that they give it part of that moment, that they have to then do something with it, spin it a certain way. It's a, it's a recognition. And there's a line in that song we just sang, Though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee. But that reality of who God is doesn't change. And though man will... will cast it aside, will even actively go and rebel against it and give hearty approval to those who do the same, Romans chapter 1. The reality is God doesn't change. And we come to him and we relate to him and we are a very blessed people that we get to come to him and we get to proclaim these things to him because these things are right and true. And so we have a picture uh, presented to us from Isaiah all the way to the book of Revelation of a God who is worthy of our worship, not our mockery, because he is the one who's created us and given us every breath, and he has invited us into relationship. We don't want to take that for granted. We don't want to take that lightly. We are welcomed because of Jesus Christ. And we're going to sing that song at the end of time that we're invited to right now to sing along with him. Worthy is 
the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Sing that again. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. Holy, holy, holy. The Lord God Almighty was in his and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. in rainbows of living color flashes of lightning rolls of thunder blessing and honor strength and glory and power be to you the only wise king holy 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 is the Lord was and is and is to come. All creation I sing, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. With wonder, awestruck wonder at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Come. With all creation I see, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Holy, 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 it's the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Will adore you. Worthy. Worthy is the final song is um, a song called Praise the King. Um, the reason that we can come into this room and sing holy, 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 and not um, just shrink back in terror or in fear is because of what Christ has done. And this song just proclaims how grateful we are to that risen, slain one who invites us in.
There's a reason why a hearse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. There's a King. He can be courageous. There's a reason why the dead are made alive. There's a reason why we share his resurrection. Jesus is alive. Oh, he's alive. Praise the King. Father, we thank you that you are alive, um, that you are our God that reigns over all things, that Jesus Christ has conquered death, hell, sin, the grave, that the world cannot ignore that. As much as they want to uh, refute it, repudiate it, Father, there is a name above all names, and we have been offered the gift of life. We've been offered the opportunity not to push against, but to embrace and receive. We have been offered as your creation the reason that we were created, and that is to know you and be known by you. We have been offered the opportunity to proclaim you rightly, to live in relationship with you rightly. And Lord, we ask that even as we have worshipped through song, that you'd help us to worship through the word and through all of our lives so that the world would see you rightly and know you just as you desire to be known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Take a step for every dinner you didn't eat together at the table this week. If either of you would say that work hours or work stress can be a barrier to enjoying time in marriage, take four steps forward. If you feel like your marriage has fallen into a bit of a rut, the cell phone is a distraction in your relationship. Did you go to bed at different times any night this week? Feel like life has gotten hectic and a bit overwhelming? Do either of you take your cell phone to bed at night? Did you go on an intentional scheduled date this week? Life is managing you more than you're managing your own life. Okay, you can both turn around. When you see the distance, uh, what one word comes to your mind? Alone, because we're really separated, really far apart. Sad. Sad? Why is that? Life. A uh, challenge. All right, let's get closer, whatever we gotta do. Sad, because I wanna be close to him. Doesn't seem like we would be, like the distance would be there, but. Look like a tunnel. A long tunnel seems so far away and so small. You really don't think about how far apart you are with all of the things that life throws at you until you quantify it in a moment like this. Would either of you like to get together and put together a strategy so that cell phones are not a distraction in a relationship at all? Take two steps forward. Would either of you like to put together a vision for your marriage and get on the same page and work toward it? Would either of you like to grow in both praying together and praying for each other? Would either of you like a better atmosphere in the home that's full of grace and peace? Would either of you like to learn to say no to some things so that you can be together as a family more often? Over this summer, we had the opportunity to um, preach a series on marriage, and um, many of you went also through the book study with us this past spring, and that marriage study was more of a theology of marriage. How do we rightly understand marriage in a world that wants to paint a lot of different pictures, uh, degrade marriage and its value, um, push it off because it's not necessary? And so we were challenged with what does it look like for us to understand what a biblical marriage is. And it wasn't necessarily the practical, um, as much as we kind of added those kind of things at the end were some opportunities for you to kind of put into practice the things that we were talking about because it was more of right thinking about marriage so that we as a church, whether you're married or single, we would understand what is it what is right as we go out and defend marriage, as we defend a biblical view of singlehood. Um, that, that whole picture, that the church at large could do that well. But we also recognize that there is a need for those who are in marriage um, to keep a strong and healthy marriage. One of the best um, advocates of marriage before a watching world is for Christians to live out a clear picture of a biblical marriage. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but it means that we're Christ-centered in what we do and we're driving ourselves towards honoring him more and more in it. And so this fall, Grace Marriage is a ministry that is going to come alongside of those who are looking for that more practical way of having um, their marriage maybe worked on. This is not just for those who are in desperate need of trying to get their marriages fixed. The desire actually is a maintenance. This is a, a seven-year uh, curriculum 
You don't necessarily have to agree at the very beginning that you're going to go through seven years of it. But this is an opportunity, and I say that because it's an ongoing kind of ministry, recognizing that we just find life pulling us apart. And then we find in life different life circumstances happening. Right? So you might be newlyweds just trying to figure out how to hold this thing together in the early rocky stages where you're trying to figure out what is it like to live with this person who you thought you knew until they didn't know how to use the toilet paper roll, right? But it also is then for those who have brought along kids in the, to the equation, and now those kids are dominating all their attention and they're forgetting about one another. But it goes beyond that because it's not locked to certain groups of marriages. In fact, there are empty nesters Right? There are new stages in life where you may be now finding yourself staring across the dinner table at someone that you're going, wow, now I have to get to know you again. I didn't realize how much I had put that to the side. It may be that you're entering a season where you are taking care of um, aging parents. How do you guys do that well without killing each other in the process? It may be that you're in those older years of a marriage, and you're saying, how do we still do this well? How do we love our kids well together? How do we love our grandkids or great-grandkids, maybe, that the Lord has given? So this is actually for all age groups. Um, Each person on staff has actually been through a weekend um, of this, and uh, each one, you can ask them, uh, can endorse that. Uh, I I need to get Shane and uh, Meredith, because they just came on staff, uh, to, to be involved in that. But it's going to be four times a year, quarterly, that we're going to engage in this. You're going to hear more about it. But I want to challenge you. Um, we need healthy marriages. We need maintenance. And this kind of helps you prioritize that in your life. So as you participate in this, it's simply asking each other questions, getting to know each other, refocusing, reprioritizing. It's a beautiful thing. Um, I've been challenged uh, the times that I've gone through that introductory weekend of reminding myself of how much I love my wife and how much I want to continue to grow in relationship with her and with the Lord in my relationship and my marriage. And so you'll hear more about it, but we want to continue to put it out there in front of you. Pray about this. Talk about this with your spouse. If you're married, this is something for you uh, to be engaged in, whether it's early or late in the game. This is something that we all need. Well, this morning, um, now I'm going to transition to our sermon series. Last week, I I launched a series entitled, Who's God? Who is this God that we serve, right? Because it makes a difference between who is God and whose God are we worshiping. And that can be one that we've created in our own minds more than the one who actually exists. And last week, we talked about the fact that This series is possible because God is a knowable God, and God wants us to know him, whether it's through his word, whether it's through his spirit who indwells us. And so each of the next six weeks, we're going to look at a different attribute of who God is, what God's word says about him, and then how do we respond to that. And each of these six uh, sermons are going to be preached by our Elder Pathway gentlemen who have been working um, with Pastor Eric and I through the lay elder process over the last 11 months or so. As they've begun a journey, they've been reading a lot of books, they've been praying for you all, uh, they've been ministering to you, maybe they're leading classes, maybe they're leading prayer meeting, um, but now they're going to get a chance to kind of stand before the body for you to get to know them a little better, to hear their hearts um, and to hear them um, teach God's word. Jonathan Beasley is uh, first up um, in doing so. Uh, There's a little bio about Jonathan in the bulletin just to kind of give you a background. Um, The Beasley family hasn't been with us for a long, long time. In fact, he's the newest of the the six gentlemen um, that make up that pathway group of men. And so he may be someone who is unknown to you, and so this is your opportunity to see him. Um, His wife Cheryl is sitting uh, next to him, and they've got two kiddos. Um, But as he comes, uh, pray for him as he has the opportunity to do this, but also pray for yourself. Um, We're we're talking about holiness. Um, That's a really big topic, and it calls us into a deep worship. 
And so I just want to pray for him as he comes. Father, as we now sit under your word, I pray that you would speak to us and you would help us to understand who you are better so that we might worship in a deeper level, that we might live out our lives in a better response to you. God, would you use your word this morning, and I pray you bless Jonathan as he brings your message, that you would give him um, the exact strength that he needs, you would give him everything that he needs, that he might be able to be used by you as a vessel for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. As uh, Pastor B just said, I am Jonathan Beasley, and um, this morning uh, we're going to be talking about one of God's attributes, and that attribute is his holiness. Um, I do have to admit, uh, when BJ presented the um, Elder Pathway gentlemen options to pick a topic, I was a little flippant in my decision. I just kind of picked one of the attributes and said, that's the one I'm going to preach on, and um, holiness. That's, that's where I was led. So um, what's interesting about this concept of holiness is that I think we all have various different definitions, and I think this morning we'll, we'll talk a little bit about um, where I see God's holiness and what that means for your life. Um, I, uh, let me go to the first slide. I entitled this message, Aspire to be Holy, for God is Holy. And if you guys recall back in May in the uh, elder pamphlet that we had placed in the bulletin, uh, there was a discussion point about who should uh, desire to be an elder. And uh, the elder team put together a response to that, and that response was focused around this concept of aspiring. And within that, the Holy Spirit creates this calling in us. And then that calling aligns with our spirit to create this internal desire to whatever it is he is calling us to do. In the case of the elder pathway, those gentlemen, including myself, we feel that desire that the Holy Spirit has given us to shepherd this body. And this morning, I want us to recognize that God has that same calling to us to aspire to be holy, that internal desire aligned with his spirit to be holy. So if you would please um, open to Exodus 3 uh, in your Bibles. This passage is probably very well known to many of you. This is actually uh, Moses encountering God at the burning bush. Um, If you recall, he grew up in Egypt, was considered something of a prince in Egypt, And then he decided to flee Egypt because he had murdered one of the taskmasters as they uh, were beating one of the Jewish slaves. Pharaoh found out. Pharaoh was angry. Pharaoh wanted to kill him. He fled. He fled to the area of Midian where um, he he took up this profession of shepherding the the flocks um, out there. And so Now we're going to pick up in Exodus 3, so if you would please stand to read God's Word, and we will read Exodus 3, verses 1 through 12. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush, So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses responded and said, Here I am. Then God said to him, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Verse 7, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, 
So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Verse 12, So God said to him, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to stand before your people, to share your word with them. And I pray, Father, that you would give me the strength and encouragement to be faithful to your word as I present it. And I also pray, Father, that your spirit would work in all of their lives as they hear the word, as they internalize the word, as they meditate on the word, and the word would become alive in their lives, and that they would know that you are holy, and that they would live their lives as though you are holy working in them. It is in your name we pray. Amen. So last week, um, when I was talking to a life group, the young adults, about um, this series. They knew that uh, the elder candidates were going to be preaching this morning, or this, this series, starting with this morning. Uh, they didn't know what the order was going to be, um, and so they asked me, when was my opportunity to stand before you to preach? And I shared with them it was this week. And they also asked me, well, what topic are you going to be talking about? And I said, the holiness of God. And uh, one of them uh, expressed that although preaching can be scary, defining holiness was easy. And though I certainly agree with him on the first point, uh, standing in front of you all is certainly something I never thought I would be doing at any point in my life, um, but here I am today. Um, I also think that defining holiness can be tricky for us. Um, I don't necessarily think that we can fully grasp all the aspects of holiness without really diving into it. So um, thankfully, we have some help. We can pull out Merriam-Webster's definition. Um, and I kind of pulled some of the uh, different definitions that Merriam-Webster had together in kind of a, this concept um, that uh, holy is exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. Divine. Devoted entirely to God or the work of God. Now, that's a fine definition. Um, I think it hits on a lot of good things about God. He is perfect. He is worthy of complete devotion. Um, he is righteous. He's good. He's also divine. These are all true attributes of God. Uh, when I look at a definition that I was pulling together for this sermon, I tried to simplify it a little bit, and my definition is that God is without blemish, spotless, divine, and set apart. And this morning, we will talk a lot about that aspect of God being set apart. I think it's easy for us to look at God and see that, yes, he is perfect, that he is spotless, that he is without blemish. But I do want to focus a little bit this morning on that aspect of God being set apart. God is the uncreated one, the maker of all things. You, me, the universe, the heavens, all beings, spiritual, physical, God created all of these things. All of us are made possible by God. However, that means that God is set apart from his creation. There's God, and then there's everything else underneath him, his creation. Holiness has two aspects here. We have the unblemished self, the perfection that is God. But then we have this 
otherness that we have to contend with, this fact that God is set apart, that he is not part of his creation, he is above his creation. So the first point this morning, we should recognize that God is holy. We see in our passage this morning that Moses is instructed that he is standing on holy ground. Verse 5, take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. See, God drew near to Moses to reveal an important truth about his nature, that he is set apart from the rest. We see other examples of God's straightforward revelation to mankind when it comes to his holiness. For example, in Leviticus, as God is revealing the law to Moses, uh, Leviticus 11.44, in the midst of him giving the laws to Moses, he says, you shall be holy. And this is a command to the nation of Israel. You shall be holy, for I am holy. God repeats that same phrase in Leviticus 19, 20, and 21 as he is doling out what he expects the nation of Israel to do, how he expects the nation of Israel to act, how he expects the nation of Israel to even think about his laws. And so he has that expectation that the nation of Israel, the nation of his people, us as Christians, to be devoted entirely to God. To be holy like God requires devotion to the things of God. To be holy like God requires devotion to the things of God. So we, we see in Leviticus where God is proclaiming his holiness to Moses to share with the people. But God isn't the only person who claims his holiness to his creation. In fact, we see angels declaring holiness as well. As uh, Pastor Shane shared this morning, out of Isaiah 6, we see the seraphim crying out in heaven, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then we have this parallel passage from the Apostle John in Revelation, where he also sees the throne room of heaven, and the angels are proclaiming now, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So we get this glimpse of heaven, the throne room of God, and we get to see how the created beings, angels, are worshiping God in his throne room, and they're crying out, Holy, 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 giving constant praise to a worthy God. 100% devoted to the worship of God and proclaiming his holiness in heaven. In addition, that um, Revelation 4 passage tells us that the seraphim aren't able to rest day or night. They are charged entirely there to worship God. But angels aren't the only created beings that sing and praise God's holiness. In fact, we look in Psalm 22 and Psalm 99, Psalm 22, 3. But you are holy, God, enthroned in the praises of Israel. In Psalm 99, 5, exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. The psalmist is proclaiming God's holiness, as do we when we sing, holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We sing, worthy is the Lamb, holy, holy is He. So we see that in our hymns, holy, holy, holy. That's the first song we sang this morning. We, God's people, are singing His holiness. The Revelation song by Phillips, Craig, and Dean. That was the second song we sang this morning. Singing of worthy is the Lamb who is slain, holy, holy is He. God declares his holiness as one perfected in goodness and righteousness, and his creation from angels to mankind affirm his holiness. God is holy, spotless, without blemish, divine, and set apart. 
is worthy of complete devotion. But not only is God holy, and this is the part where I mentioned we, we really need to wrestle with this concept of God being set apart. His presence commands holiness. It's not just him. In his physical presence, God commands holiness of all beings. This morning in our passage, again, I will go back to verse 5. We see God telling Moses, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place you stand is holy ground. Now the ground itself, other than being on Mount Sinai, there's really nothing special to that except for the fact that God was there. God's very presence made that place holy while he was there. It's like God's presence, as we're drawn near to him, that he exudes this holiness that cannot be denied. So there's a problem here for Moses. He is in a conundrum. A holy God who created the universe to be devoted entirely to himself and his works commands his created, in this case Moses, to recognize that he isn't set apart from God. Moses wasn't holy, and neither are we. So this brings us to our second point this morning. We should recognize that we are not holy. In our passage, we also see that Moses' reaction to the sinless, spotless, blameless God in verse 6. Um, my Bible says, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. In the presence of a living God, of a holy God, Moses recognized what some in this world fail to recognize, his own sin. God is before him, and Moses recognizes his sin, and God doesn't prompt him, but Moses instinctively reacts to hide his face from holy God. In Isaiah 6.3, we see how Isaiah responds to the presence of a holy God by claiming, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. Isaiah recognized that he was a man of unclean lips and that he didn't feel worthy to be in the presence of a holy God. Interestingly, that parallel passage that we talked about to Isaiah in Revelation, where the apostle John also gets a glimpse of the throne room, as Jesus appears to him, John falls down as if dead. His reaction to a holy God is not one of defiance, of telling God what he can do, why he deserves to be in heaven. His reaction is he's going to pass out. That surely doesn't sound like a, a courtroom to me where you get to proclaim your innocence. Before a holy God, the apostle John passed out and fell at Jesus' feet as if dead. So we have three examples of the created before a holy creator. In the presence of a holy God, we instantly recognize the distinction of our sin versus the spotless one, that of the holy nature of God. But thankfully, God is not content with sitting on his throne and watching us flounder in sin. No, he recognizes that there's this gap between sin and his holiness. This gap between the nature of the creator from the nature of the created. In Exodus 3.8, God left his throne saying, So I have come down to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Egyptians. So we see this picture of God coming down to earth to save a sinful and lost nation of Israel. God desires us to be holy and is willing to help us in our unholy state. He later tells Moses in Leviticus 19 verse 2 that Moses should speak to all the uh, congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, 
You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. This is a command. This isn't a suggestion. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. God expects us, his people, to be holy because he is holy. God expects us, his creation, to be holy because he is holy. But we have this problem, you see, because we're not. We aren't inherently holy. We're inherently sinful. We rebel against God. We're certainly not holy by Levitical standards. We're not holy by the Pentateuch, as God was revealing his law to Moses. And even Paul in his writings in Romans, Romans 3.20, he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So God sent the law to Moses and the Israelites. We get that in our first five books of the Bible, and that has created this knowledge of sin. And what do we do with it? We go and sin. We sin, we rebel against a holy God. And then a few verses later, Paul reveals what many of us have probably memorized or known in Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We don't match his holiness. So do this exercise with me real quick this morning. Think of somebody, a person, not God, therefore not Jesus, But think of somebody who is maybe the best example of holiness. It can be in your life. It can be in the Bible. Now think of how they have failed to hit that mark. How they have failed to be spotless without blemish. How they failed to meet the exacting perfect will of a holy God. So I have some examples this morning. If perhaps you thought of Abraham and Sarah, considered righteous in God's eyes. They walked with God. God spoke with them. God promised Abraham and Sarah that he would create a holy nation from their offspring. But in God's timing, did not align with their timing. They grew impatient. They turned to a servant And that servant was Hagar. They failed to trust in that moment of weakness the promise of a holy God. Perhaps you thought of Moses, the protagonist in this morning's story, if you will. Moses, in this very chapter and in the next, is contending with God and God's calling to him to serve him and ministering to the nation of Israel. But what does Moses do? Moses comes up with every excuse he can possibly think of as to why God was wrong and Moses was right. It got to the point that by the time we get into Exodus 4.14, that God became angry with Moses for fighting him on what his will was. The anger of God burned against Moses because Moses was refusing in that moment to accept the mantle that God had placed upon him as spokesperson and leader, shepherd of the flock of God. Perhaps you thought of King David, a man after God's own heart. King David, he had this problem. He liked women. He liked a few of them. He didn't seem to care if they were married or not. That's not meeting the exacting desire of God's holiness, is it? Perhaps John the Baptist. The voice crying out in the wilderness to prepare ye the way of the Lord. Even John the Baptist faltered. After he had baptized Jesus, he sent two men to Jesus later on in the ministry to confirm with Jesus that he was in fact the Messiah. John the Baptist baptized him. He saw the Trinity in front of him. The voice of God he could hear. 
his son in the river, the Jordan River, and the Spirit of God descending like a dove. He saw all of this, and yet, at a later time, he had his doubts. Or perhaps you thought of yourself. You thought, maybe I am. I am the embodiment of a holy God. Church, I'll warn you against that. That's ego. That's hubris. Proverbs 3.34 tells us, God opposes the proud. Do not think this. It is sinful to think this. You see, when we look at all these examples or even individuals that you thought of, it doesn't matter who you thought of. God is clear that all have sinned and fallen short of his glory, of his holiness, of his exacting standards that he expects of his creation. You see, holiness isn't measured in closeness to the mark. You either are or you aren't. You are either holy, spotless, without blame, set apart, or you're not. You are set apart from the rest, as God is, or you are the rest. So what hope do we, as a sinful people, have when compared to the one who is set apart from his creation? The God of the universe, who is spotless, without blemish. The first step here is we should acknowledge that God does desire us to be holy. We should take heart because that same God who put in those exacting standards, the law, the spotless one, the one without blemish, the one who is set apart from all of his creation, he desires us to be holy. We should acknowledge that God desires us to be holy. When we look at the passage this morning in Exodus 3, verse 5, we see God tell Moses not to come near him, for the ground is holy, holy by his presence. God is holy. Moses was not. God did not want Moses to draw close without considering God's holiness and confronting Moses' sinfulness. He wanted Moses to consider God's holiness compared to Moses' sinfulness. But God provided a means by which Moses could draw near, removing his sandals. Now, church, to be clear, I don't think there was really anything special about removing his sandals. Um, There's some commentators that talked about how um, the, the feet is this pathway to demonstrate that we are part of his creation. I think that's a little bit of a stretch. Um, there was another commentator that I came across that said uh, this was a token of respect and submission. Uh, yes. What did God tell him to do? Take his sandals off. Moses responded with obedience by removing his sandals. However, I can't believe that Moses' response to God in this moment was a response that was perhaps as flippant as me picking the topic this morning, or even as I think of how I and my wife ask our kids to remove their shoes uh, when we get home. You see, it's become something of an Olympic sport, this is the season, in our house where removing our shoes requires us to stand a little bit away from where we place our shoes We line up our shot, we prepare ourselves, and we flip them across the room, through the air, off the wall, into the pile of shoes. They've gotten pretty good at it. We've gotten a little frustrated with it. No, I don't think that method quite hits the mark of take your shoes off. Even if they want to exclaim Kobe as they flip their shoes off and it lands. Now, some of you don't understand this joke. You see, this is a Gen Z thing. And I wanted to appeal a little bit this morning with a Gen Z and and, uh, Tim over there is laughing and I really appreciate that. Um, You see, with Gen Z and even some millennials and and Gen Y, um, when they throw something, take a shot, 
They will say Kobe and walk away as if it is going to land where they want it to land. So maybe this joke with some of you didn't quite land where I thought it might, but I know some of the younger crowd certainly gets it. You see, I don't think that's how Moses responded to a holy God. In a way of enjoyment, no. I see Moses thinking very carefully about the scenario that he's in where he sees the personification of God in this bush and this bush is not being consumed by the fire. And I see him wondering in awe of what is this sight. I want to draw closer, but I can't because the voice in that bush said, do not draw near to this place. And I'm sensing this otherness, this holiness that's in front of me and I am not holy. And this voice is now telling me to take off my sandals. I see Moses at this point almost distractedly reaching down and loosening his sandals and taking his sandals off and standing there before a holy God, almost as if naked at this point before a holy God. I think in that moment, Moses probably experienced something that um, R.C. Sproul articulated in his book, The Holiness of God, and that was in the presence of a, that he was in a presence of a God who could fill me with terror in one second and with peace in the next. Moses' sin was evident to him, so much so that he hid his face in fear. Have any of you had the opportunity to experience what Sproul is saying here? Experience the presence of a perfect and holy God, and in that moment be filled with terror and also be filled with peace in the next. I can say that um, this was very true in my life about a year ago. We were in the midst of experiencing God, and I took that study very seriously in my life. It was very important. At, at that point, I felt like the Spirit was leading me to really grow and dive deep into my relationship with Him. Um, and in that study, there is a challenge to surrender yourself to a holy God. For 28 years, I had proclaimed, not my will, but your will. For 28 years, I had proclaimed, I surrender all. But I hadn't quite lived up to those claims. I was willing to accept God's will when it suited my desires. I was willing to accept God's will as long as it didn't really challenge me. As long as it didn't really charge the fortresses in my life, those castles that I had put up that were for me and for me alone. I was willing to surrender the rest. It was easy for me to give those things up, but not the things that I held on dear, things that I wanted. I was a hypocrite, proclaiming I surrender all. I was lying to a holy God when I sang those hymns and professed those sentiments because I hadn't surrendered all, if it meant standing before you preaching this morning. I hadn't surrendered at all if it meant going overseas and serving a holy God and sharing the gospel with a nation who did not know him. I hadn't surrendered at all if my hobbies that inherently weren't sinful, but over time had become sinful because they took me away from a holy God. I had not surrendered at all. And I remember, alone in prayer, doing this study, and then I felt a conviction. It wasn't a little conviction. I felt a lot convicted. I felt God speak to my heart that day, and he said, 
you say I surrender all, Jonathan, yet you refuse to surrender all aspects of your life to me. That isn't surrender. Do you trust me or not? How can you call yourself a Christian and deny me access to certain parts of your life that you hold closer than me? You hypocrite. That's a deep swallow, church. That's a gulp. When the God of creation confronts you on sin, there's no place to hide. There's no place to go. It's you and the Creator. And He has a perfectly good charge against you. You see, God's sovereignty hit my consciousness like a freight train. Next slide. Some of you may be familiar with this meme. Okay. My consciousness is the school bus in this case. As I'm praying to God going along my merry way, I didn't see the freight train of God's sovereignty coming my way. But I did when he called me out. He got my attention. He got my attention. We contended for about five minutes, and (laughs) yes, he uh, firmly dismantled my feeble reasons to hold on to my will, Um, and the grand scheme of 28 years, it was a pathetic defense. I attempted to logically refuse his claim, but after the first minute, my heart was no longer in it. By minute five, I was bawling like a hungry newborn thirsting for the truth of my holy God. Weeks later, um, we're still in the Experiencing God study, and uh, God and I had another conversation about this same topic. And uh, he reminded me that there were maybe some areas that I had done a good job of surrendering to him, but I hadn't quite gotten rid of a few other areas. And... As we were vetting the truth, this time I was not interested in wrestling with the Holy God. I remember the chastisement. The last time we'd spoke, I surrendered. He did something in that moment that I did not expect. And it's hard to describe, I will do my best. But in that moment, as I surrendered, and this time I fully meant it, I fully intended it, and that's the path we're on right now, God revealed something to me that I can only describe as filling a cup. You see, in that moment, God had my attention, and he decided to start pouring his holiness into my life in that moment. Um, I think of it with, uh, when I was a kid, and my dad would uh, get us a cool drink of water or milk or something like that, and he would pour it out, and as he was pouring, he would say, say when, when we wanted him to stop pouring. Say when. And as kids, uh, we wanted to have as much of the beverage as we could, so we would wait. And as he is pouring, there's almost, you can hear his voice increasing a little bit. Say when, say when, say when, until the fairy brim, and we say, when? That was my experience with the Holy God. He started pouring his grace, his holiness into me to the point that I could sense this bursting joy and peace. But if he didn't stop pouring it would be to my destruction. And so sitting there, as he's pouring his gracious holiness into me, I cried out, when, Father? When? And in that moment, I could sense what Sproul talked about, that terror one second and peace in the next. But you see, God didn't completely overwhelm my being with his holiness. He certainly could have and would have been justified in doing so because he is a holy God. We see Moses' response in verse 6. He hid his face. Moses hid his face from a holy God, knowing he wasn't holy. He had taken the first step to holiness, obeying God's command, but that didn't make him holy. God was initiating the invitation for Moses to join him in his work to free his chosen nation of Egypt. 
See, last year, uh, those of you who did participate in that Experiencing God study, we learned about the reality three of God's invitation for us to become involved in his work. Here's that pivotal example in Moses' life where Moses started being involved in God's work. To do so, Moses needed to aspire to be holy, if for no other reason than to hear what God had to say to him. What daring curiosity. May we have such courage to seek God and only hide our face from him. Later, when Moses found himself visiting with God on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19, verses 4 and 5, God tells Moses to share with Israel You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. We see God pouring out the stipulation for holiness, and it really didn't have anything to do with dirty sandals. It was obedience. Obedience to his commands, laws, and expectations. That's what God desired. The creator of heaven and earth, savior of the enslaved in Egypt, desired his chosen people, the Israelites, to be holy just like him. How would that happen? Through obedience. How did they do? They failed. They failed a lot, over and over and over again. They failed. God became so weary of their failure to obey him that he sent nations around them to enslave them, to scatter them across his creation, the Assyrians and the Babylonians. How do we see God react to the sinful nature of the pre-flood world as they were thumbing their nose in sin before a holy God? He wiped them out, except for Noah and his family. God cannot abide with sin. He cannot. Even the smallest minute error is a blemish against a spotless record. What hope do we have? Even in obedience, we fall short of his holy standard. But isn't it great that this isn't the end of the story? Amen? You see, God did not leave us in despair. We see a glimmer here, a hope a piece of information that maybe you haven't caught before. If we look in our passage this morning, verse 12 in Exodus 3, we see God tell Moses, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you when you are obedient and have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. Did you guys see the hope in there? For Moses, it's the, province, uh, or it's the um, promise of deliverance and fellowship with a holy God. Hallelujah, right? For us, we have a little bit of hindsight in Matthew's gospel. We see the promise of Jesus here. To Moses, the coming Messiah, to us, the fulfillment of this promise that God said, I will be with you. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus condescended from heaven to be with us, to save us from our own disobedience. Even at his ascension, Jesus promised to be with us always, to the end of the age. Do you see the revelation of this promise that God revealed to Moses, and that promise of the person of Jesus? If we're obedient to God, he will be with, he will be with us. And that obedience leads to holiness as we draw closer to God. The Apostle Peter, I think, summarizes this very well. Uh, in his first epistle, he wrote, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. Peter is obviously quoting Leviticus here, Um, be holy, for I am holy. The audience has changed a little bit. He's talking to Christians now, not the nation of Israel. But the message is the same. It's the same message. 
Be holy, for God is holy. We see a similar passage in Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, where Paul says that we should be holy and without blame before him, God, in love. Obviously, we could talk a lot about these epistles and uh, draw a lot of information on that, but we are running on time here. We're going to move on to the points. So, three points of application on how we can be holy. Point number one, obey God's commands. We may not understand why God asks us to do the things he does. He rarely explains what he's doing. How blessed was Moses to get a full explanation of how God was going to work in his life and the Israelites, right? He laid it out. This is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. This is your response to it. This is what Pharaoh's going to do, and this is what I'm going to do. We rarely get that. Um, He usually only reveals a small portion, a step, and then he waits for us to obey him. And I know that's very true in my life. Um... Sometime when we get to know each other a little bit more, we should talk about how my wife and I ended up here in northern Kentucky. Um, It's a longer story, and I don't want to uh, take up more time this morning talking about it, but the punchline in this story is that individuals, Christians, who love God and are told to do something are expected to be obedient to God's command. See, Moses removed his sandals from God. He obeyed God and brought Israel out of Egypt. In my life, God showed great patience, but he brought us to northern Kentucky to serve a purpose. I do not know what that purpose is this morning, church, but I do expect that he will reveal it in due time. And yet, here we are in northern Kentucky, obeying God's calling for us, and I'm before you now, preaching a sermon I never thought or never a year ago, expected or wanted to be here doing this. But I am very happy to be here this morning talking to you about God's holiness. Do you love Jesus? Do you obey his commands? You see, Jesus t- told his disciples in John 14, 15, that if they loved him, they would obey his commands. So do you love Jesus? Are you serious in your love for him? then obey his commands. God is holy, you should be too. Obey him. Second point, spend time with God. God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. This is reality too from experiencing God. God wants a relationship with you. He isn't content with waving at you once a month. He isn't content with you going to our spaghetti luncheons in the beginning of the year and praying, that being the only prayer of the year to him. And he certainly isn't content with your Bible sitting on your bookshelf with a year's worth of dust and you pick it up and blow it off to read the Christmas story to your kids. That isn't obedience to God. That's not a relationship. Relationships aren't built with check-ins and afterthoughts. They don't create a real and personal relationship with God. God wants real and personal. He wants to hear from you daily, hourly, or as Paul said in 1 Thessalonians, praying without ceasing. Seek the Lord frequently. He is a holy God, and he wants to hear from you. Time with God will grow your relationship, draw you closer to him, and thereby your aspiration to his holiness. Interestingly, this is what Paul meant in Romans 12 when he said, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. God wants you, not a fake version of you. He wants you. For us to grow as Christians in sanctification, that does require some effort from you. It's not going to happen if you sit on your couch watching TV, playing and being engrossed in your own video games, or even reading a lovely fiction novel. You have to take some effort here to connect with the Holy God. Prayer, reading your Bible, meditating, fellowshipping with believers. It happens when you spend time with God. 
growing closer to him. His Holy Spirit will work in you in ways that you cannot fathom, but you have to spend time with him. It won't happen if you ignore him. And lastly, the last point this morning, believe in Jesus Christ. Aspiration of God and His holiness starts with belief of His Son, Jesus Christ. Who is familiar with how Ephesians 2, 4 begins? The first word. Raise your hand. Don't cheat. Do you want to know how Ephesians 4, Ephesians 2, verse 4 begins? It starts with the word, but. But because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. We were dead in our trespasses, but God. We had no hope of eternity or in paradise, but God. We were lost in our own sinful lusts, but God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive together with Christ. What a passage! But God, this has the imagery of the cavalry coming over the hill, saving the protagonist, us. God is the cavalry, but God. We had no hope of redemption, no way to holiness, but God came to rescue the sinner. If verses 4 and 5 don't make your heart jump with joy, swoon with love, or sing with the angels in heaven, Christian, I don't know what will. But God! Later in verse 8 in Ephesians, he makes it clear how we can experience that but God moment through faith in the redemptive life and work of his Son, Jesus Christ. Faith in but God. As, as we come to a close um, this morning... I'm reminded of one of my favorite song lyrics about God. It's a relatively new song. I think it was only published in uh, 2019. But I think it really captures that gospel message in a very powerful way. Now, church, I'm not going to sing it to you because God isn't the only one who is merciful. Amen? But I do want the lyrics to sink in. Let them permeate your heart. Ask yourself if you align with the message this morning. Does the gospel create an aspiration to be holy as God is holy or not? Next slide, guys. Thank you. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. Until from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets... To a virgin came the word, from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt, to reveal the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole creation, you did not despise the cross. For even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation, Jesus, for our sake, you died. In the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath, until that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe, for the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, and shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom, I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Please pray with me. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. Praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty. Praise forever, to the King of Kings. God, we thank you for your holiness, for the fact that you are set apart from the rest of your creation, 
but the fact that you are perfect and blameless. You set a standard that no other can meet, but you condescended from heaven so that we might meet you. That we might stand before a holy God one day and praise and sing to you, to live with you in heaven, in your glory, and not be destroyed by our sinfulness. We thank you, Father, and I pray this morning as we hear these words that our hearts would be touched by the holiness of yourself. I pray this morning that we would seek after you, that we would seek to be obedient, that we would draw on that relationship with you, Father. We pray that if there are hearts in this room that do not know you this morning, that they would be touched, that you would reveal yourself to those individuals, and they, they would come to know you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Father, may our lives be a testament of praise. May our obedience point to our desire to look like the one who has called us and saved us and set us apart. May that be the aroma. May that be the, um, the ambassador. May that be the presence of Christ everywhere we go because you have indwelt us, because you have come to us that we might experience not only your holiness but see it lived out in our lives. Thank you for this morning, for the chance to worship. I thank you for the message that has been declared over your people, for the reminder of your holiness and the invitation for us to join you in it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are dismissed.